So there's a thing where every time the Everesting record gets broken, uh, I just get a ton of comments on my YouTube and Strava, Phil, where's your reaction video? Which is, it's my fault, because I kept making reaction videos after I lost my record. But uh, at this point, where's Contador's Everesting reaction video? He, he lost the record, why are you guys bothering me? Whatever, fine. Uh, I've, I've, got, I've got lots of thoughts, uh, and I didn't have time to do the reaction video immediately this time, because I, was, I had to do a video about my Fonda, I've been working on that for months. Um, but I'm going to do one better this time where I'm actually, we're gonna to talk to the new record holder. So hang on one second, we're gonna call him. All right, so welcome to, uh, to my channel, Ronan McLaughlin. That's, that's your correct pronunciation, right? Uh, yes, as, uh, as close as most uh, international people can get, so. <laughs> <laughs> How do you say it? Uh, Ronan McLaughlin. McLaughlin, okay, all right, that's, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's, no, that, that, that can be done, I can get McLaughlin. Um, pretty much perfect, yeah. Yeah, dude, thanks, uh, thanks for, for coming on here, I think, I guess I guess you sort of know the the impression is um, you know a, a sort of a new fresh name came up, and and not only did you beat the Everesting record, you annihilated it in a in a hilarious way. Um, so congratulations. That's that's I got to start there. Um, Thank you. By by the transitive property of cycling results, you've won the Tour de France. That's how this works. Uh, that's what I figured. Yeah. Alberto Contador. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and the Vuelta and the Giro. Yeah, you've won all the things, but uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but more importantly, the Everesting record and, and KO, it goes Everesting record, KOM's Tour de France. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You, you were a professional. I'd, I'd heard of your team, um, but do a quick kind of bio if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, I, I'm always hesitant to say that I was a professional. Uh, I was a continental writer. I wasn't world tour like yourself. Um, but yeah, I was a UCI registered team and I spent six years with the, with the Ampost Sean Kelly team. Uh, and that was sort of from 2008 until the end of 2013. And, you know, I, although I left the Never Neverland that is full-time bike racing and then came back to the real world, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, never, I never stopped racing at home. And, you know, I've, I've kept up some international racing since then, maybe once or twice a year. So uh, I just have a love for racing and could never give it up. And tried to give it up a few times and had a couple of retirement parties and all sorts but it's still still going so what's well. an irish retirement party like it sounds like fun uh it actually the first one involved meeting my wife but i couldn't remember it uh, meeting her for the first time uh, i couldn't remember it um i actually was with uh philip dagnan you might know him he used to write for team sky yeah. and another pretty good irish writer marcus christie the three of us live pretty low, pretty close to each other and uh out and then the second retirement party was a few nights later and uh yeah I happened to accidentally meet uh, my wife for the second first time uh, and I, I remembered it after that so <laughs> that was pretty good so it was uh see i don't i don't like irish stereotypes on on my show here so i i think uh <laughs> the um no on on post was a, was a super legit team for continental teams especially in that era um we might have raced together in taiwan or something did you get over there uh taiwan no i did her tour to hokkaido once um, okay maybe a bit in europe but uh yeah it, it was a it was a pretty good team when you see some of the names that have come out of it uh, i think the most prominent right now is is sam bennett uh yep. who actually was also on that stag or that uh retirement party <laughs> so um yeah it was you know it was it was a really well-run team for the budget that they had and uh I certainly picked up all the experience and know how that I have and the basis that I have for for cycling from from the six years that I spent there. Right. The um and and since then, uh, you're still still racing uh hill climbs basically, right? Is that correct? Or are you um, doing other races as well? Yeah, mostly. Big there. The, the hill climb scene is pretty big around September October time, and uh, a couple of years ago, I, I won the regional. Hello Climb Championships and organized the National Hello Climb Championships and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the, the Irish racing scene is mostly one day races. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we used to have a pretty big UCI eight day stage race. Uh, eight day stage races are kind of few and far between nowadays. But unfortunately, a couple of years ago, it lost its sponsor and uh, it, it was supposed to be resurrected this year. But we all know what <laughs> happened with everything this year. So uh, right. hopefully, it's back on the calendar next year. And that will be another reason for me to keep going for another year. Very cool. And uh, you're full-time coaching now, basically. Is that right? Or is there another job? Uh, my full-time job is uh, working in schools, encouraging uh, kids to cycle to school rather than take the car. 
uh, okay. I work for a charity called Sostrans, yeah. So it's all about uh, active travel and uh, just uh, for, for both for the for the children's health and also for environmental reasons. Uh, and then the coaching sort of a, a a passion project or a hobby or whatever you might call it. I just really enjoy working okay. with working with other athletes. Yeah, that's really cool. Was that the charity that you benefited doing your doing your Everesting? It's not the charity that the Everesting was for. Is a a, a a missing persons search and rescue uh, group. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my wife's uncle went missing about four years ago, and they did incredible work at the height of an Irish winter and pouring rain and freezing cold, searching for them seven days a week. And since then, I, I wanted to do something for them. Um, and this seemed like you know, there's no real uh, good reason to go up and down a single piece of road sixty four <laughs> or eighty times. So. Yeah, but I know it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the the charity the charity thing seemed to. Uh, I don't know if it was a way for me to justify it or if it was just a really good idea. But either way, it was. Uh, you know, the, the charity will be massively uh, appreciative of what what's come out of it. I'll bet that's that's beautiful. I'm going to put links to both of these in the YouTube description. Uh, both those charities. The mm -hmm. um. Can you tell me a little bit about about the day? I've I've read a couple articles. There's they're focusing more on your bike, so I want to hear about that. But uh, but also your your physical training stuff like that. Um, uh, yeah, the the bike's got a lot of attention. I think it's because I chopped off the handlebars and or half the handlebars, which I've seen you've done before. Um, right. It was funny. The American audience, like I, I was familiar with hill climbs a little bit, and Americans are like, "Oh, this guy cut off the bars like you," and I'm like. Oh no, I didn't invent that. <laughs> There's a whole <laughs> hill climb thing <laughs> that uh, that I've been wanting to get to the hill climbs for years, but I've got my my fondo is in October, so it's just horrible timing. Uh, I'm that's a bucket list situation for me. I'll be too old and fat, but uh, so yeah. So your your bars, uh, what else in in that category? Uh, yeah, so I was sort of limited to what I had in the house. Uh, the only thing I really purchased specifically for the challenge was the tires. Um, and you know the first time I was running clincher and the second time was tubular so it was four times I had to buy a set of Vittoria Corsa speeds which uh, <laughs> eats up pretty much any budget anybody's got so uh, apart from that I just tried to remove as much as I could from the bike the obvious ones like the the bottle cage front to radar the the 53 chain ring I wasn't going to be using that no. um, and yeah I ended up for the second time removing all the gears that I hadn't used the first time so you know, ideally you wouldn't run an electronic group set or at least, you know, not EPS because it tends to be slightly heavier. Mm -hmm. um, but the beauty of it was that I was able to look at the, the file from the first Everest thing and see that I had only used the 25, the 28 and the 32. So <laughs> why carry the rest right. of them? Yeah, that's, make sense. That's, that's good dorking. I like that. <laughs> the, um, how was I going to say? The, Can oh yeah. Oh yeah. Back? Gearing. I was, I was interested in that. How did you, uh, what did you have on the front? I saw the back. You had your thirty-two. On the front, you had a you had a single something I hadn't seen before. It was a record twelve-speed crank, um, with just a standard thirty-nine chain ring. So I was quite worried about the chain coming off. You know, when it's it's yeah. not a, a one by specific. So uh, there was that chance. It did happen a couple of times. But I was lucky enough to get it back on. Um, but yeah, it was it was just a standard thirty nine tooth campbike chain ring. The, the campbike cranks it's incredibly hard. I think impossible to find a one by chain ring for it. So mm. I mean, that was what I had. That's what I worked with. <laughs> the, so what? Like so, I I'd kind of figured something else with when looking at the whole Everesting concept. Um, sort of what I what I learned months ago was kind of the steeper the better, uh, as far as the gradient. And I and I and it was something I I knew and I've talked about, but I didn't know anybody was going to try it. And then. Contador figured it out because, <laughs> um, and I remember thinking, and I said it in a video, like Contador of today isn't Contador of a few years ago. And, and frankly, he, I doubt if he's as good as Lachlan of today. So he, there was, there were some improvements. There were some gains that he figured out. And I think the, the gradient of his climb was, was the answer. Um, and you've sort of one upped him. So he was on a 13% and you were at 14, right? Yeah, and what I sort of figured about contours, and I don't, I don't know if it's true or not, but what I was telling myself was that it was a bit of a marketing stunt that he did. Uh, yeah, marketing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I thought maybe he just, you know, worked out what would it take to beat Lachlan Morton's time. Uh, and then he, you know, he just set about getting the record and, and erring on the side of caution because, as I'm sure you can testify to, when you're starting one of these things, nobody knows what it's like at the end. And 
you know, I had watched your video and I'd seen how much the last hour hurt and I'd seen, you know, the throwing up at the side of the road and all. And I thought, you know, uh, maybe Contador just erred on the side of caution and that's not actually maybe even his best time. It's just the time that he did. Uh, sure. And then the other thing I thought was, I didn't look too much at his ride, to be honest, because I just had to do the best that I could, not not do what mm-hmm. Contador did. And But the one thing I did notice from his was that his laps were very inconsistent and also there, yeah. there seemed to be uh, two two corners on the descent that you know wouldn't have allowed him to maximize his maximize his downhill speed as much as as I could on what was effectively a, a perfectly straight descent. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of good steep stuff in, in Ireland. Like people just send me segments and I and I star them if I if I like how they look and there's there's pages of Ireland in my Strava favorites. <laughs> so, like. Yeah, but I, I did research. I, I obviously, you know, being 2020 and everything that's gone with it, I, I wasn't going to be up for international travel, but um, right. I, I did research as many claims as I could in Ireland. And I think uh, Memore Gap, which is the one I did, which mm-hmm. just quite coincidentally is, is close by where I live. Um, I, I'm pretty certain it's the best climb in, in, in Ireland, at least uh, for, for Everesting. And, that's not just because it's straight and steep, but it's also, you know, its steepest point is right at the very top where it's like 24 and a half percent. And so for me, I was able to, you know, just get over that part, which was obviously gaining me massive elevation gain every time. Mm-hmm. And then immediately I had 40 seconds to recover. And that 24 and a half percent was getting me back up to speed incredibly quick as well. So it was, right. it was almost perfect that the steepest pitch was right at the top. Right. That's, that's fun. What was your... Even even with at that gradient, what's your cadence? Are you going sixty average? I think or fifty six average or something for the whole day. Crazy. Yeah. Well, that's average. That's not including the coasting. Or not it? including the coasting, but I, I oh. don't. Uh, I, I don't imagine that uh, it would have been much higher than that at any point. Oh, that's rough. I was kind of <laughs> planning my gearing to to like at least let me spin eighty five. Yeah, you but that. you probably have the ability to do that, whereas the only talent I have is just ignorance. Um, so <laughs> get it in a big gear and suffer through it. And, you know, it's I, it's an old-fashioned style. I, I doubt if that's true, doing a 704. The, um, so tell me a little about your training. Uh, my training, I... I sort of, um, although I didn't use power on the day as as my only sort of pacing tool, what I what I did sort of do was look at lactate uh, accumulation rates and lactate combustion rates, and then just tried to ensure that the bottom of the climb, when the gradient was a bit shallower, was basically combusting the lactate that I generated at the top of the climb, uh, and you know that I spent a lot of time doing over unders for for that specific reason, and then also a lot of time just doing steady sustained low gear tempo work for three or four hours on the end and the theory behind that was it might not be too scientific but the theory was if i can do it for three and a half four hours without a break then if i'm getting a 40 second descent every four minutes i should be able to do it for seven and a half hours so or, you're just riding around in your in your 5311 pretty much yeah i was riding around to like the the opposite of an everything i was riding around at like 40k an hour average for for three weeks awesome <laughs> <laughs> but yeah for that like that was loads of fun as well so it was like you know i had i had the aero bars and 60 mil wheels and aero helmet and skin suit and everything for that as well just you know mm-hmm. absolutely ripping up uh every road i could find and uh, that was loads of fun as well like. beautiful and uh so the the arc of your thing you did an 804 uh you didn't ever sting an 804 and 809. then 809 sorry yeah. and then uh and then you and you looked at it and was like oh i, I know i had some left in the tank uh, what changes did you make to go over an hour faster, what, like a few weeks apart? Yeah, so the first time, uh, and I can probably blame you for this slightly, like I was I was pretty nervous going into it. I was like, it, like the last time I got nervous for a, a, a cycling event was the World Elite World Championships. Uh, I, I don't tend to get nervous for them anymore. Um, but this one, I was genuinely fearful that it actually wasn't possible to cycle up my more gap 64 times. Um, so it, uh, on the first attempt, I just erred on the side of caution for everything. Uh, so much so that at one at one point I was doing like one lap semi semi hard, and then the next lap pretty easy, just to mm. ensure that I would actually get to the finish. Right. And I had also included uh, a flatter section at the bottom and a flatter section at the top, 
just to give me extra recovery time. Right. Um, by removing those flatter sections for the second second attempt, I actually saved like 35 kilometers off the right. Uh, right. You can save 35 kilometers, 17 and a half of which is going uphill. You know, it's going to make a huge difference. And actually, coincidentally, my average speed was almost 17 and a half kilometers per hour for the second attempt. So you could nearly say there's an hour straight away that, I, that I've saved. Yeah, interesting. With, uh, but yeah, I kind of I, I did realize that before the first attempt, but I just wasn't willing to take the risk that, you know, because it was a shorter segment, I I had to do it more time, so I ended up doing eighty laps the second time. Right. Yeah, that's a lot of that's a lot of stress on the old brake pads. <laughs> <going down laughs> at, at that speed. Yeah, and the first two hours it was raining, so it was a uh, you know it was even more of a you know carbon brake pads in the wet tend to get eat up by the runs like so. Right. That was also on my list. Why did you do it when it was raining? Why didn't you wait a couple hours? Uh, I kind of, well, I wasn't going to wait for a headwind. I don't wait to start with. Um, so I was kind of keeping an eye on the weather forecast, you know, for, for as far in advance as it could. But mm -hmm. given that it's weather forecast, you, uh, you can only really trust it from about four or five days out. So right. on both occasions, actually on the first occasion, uh, I was doing it on a, a Sunday. looked like it would be a good day for it. So I planned to do it on a Sunday. I got to the Thursday and the weather forecast completely changed and it looked like it was going to be a headwind and terrible weather. So I did a pretty big training session. I'd done a pretty hard gym session uh, and then I got up on Friday morning and the forecast was, you know, saying that it was going to be great again. So right. I, I definitely went into the first one pretty fatigued as well. Um, but then for the second one, um, yeah, again, it just looked like it was going to be a good day. A Thursday afternoon is a bit random time to do it, but it, it looked like it was going to be pretty much a perfect day so long as the rain stopped at about one o'clock when it was forecast to. Mm -hmm. Now, I got to the climb at about one o'clock and we still couldn't even see the top of it, which is only 800 meters away. <laughs> it was raining that hard and it was, uh, it was just, it was not a nice day. Um, but I kind of at that stage said, I've committed to this on Instagram. Uh, the bigger reason I'm doing this is for charity more so than anything else. So get on your bike and, and go basically. And, yeah, it worked out in the end up that the weather did clear up, so it was okay. cool. Very cool. The um, mm. people people talk about the uh, when when Contador got it, everyone was like, "Oh, this record is dead. This is a uh, and and I I kind of went back to that was a different like cyclists cycling fans are like if Eddie Merckx tried it tomorrow, they'd be like, "Oh, the record's dead. That's Eddie Merckx." <laughs> um, <laughs> who uh. Who who's on your list for 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 taking it from you? Who do you think could could figure something else out or, or go a little faster? Uh, Phil Gaiman, maybe. Um, I hope I pronounced your name right. <laughs> Here's, you you did. Here's the thing: is I I had this torturous situation where I did it in like the last day that wasn't blistering hot in Los Angeles, and then I got super into it, and now a I can't travel, and b it's it's super hot every day. So there's, I, I've, I've got a few months, so I'm not even going to be scared to go out there. I'm not doing it. I saw like, yeah. And your pictures from yours, I saw people in parkas. I was like, that's the kind of conditions I need. For, <laughs> <laughs> I want it to be cold, cold out. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was probably about 15 Celsius, but you know, we also had cloud cover, which meant that I definitely wasn't getting any baking in the sun. But uh, I, I think uh, you're right though. Like with Condor at the top of the list, it would probably put uh, a lot of people off, but with my name at the top of the list and 99.9% .9 of people not knowing it, they'll probably go, right. well, I well, can like, do that. Except for the time being 25 minutes faster than Contador's. <laughs> I think you've, you've, you've done enough intimidation. Um, um, yeah, but there's definitely, there, there, it, it can definitely go lower. Uh, and I, I don't know who, but I'm excited to see who, who right. does it next. Yeah, in the in the weight saving, there's another question I had on my on my list. I forgot the in the weight saving department. Uh, how much did your motor weigh? <laughs> <laughs> there's the grand. They talk about the cassette you shaved off. I'm like, I want to know. Um, <laughs> no, dude, that's uh, super cool. It, it's I, I saw a study, some some German study that kind of said the uh, the they set the max or the the best time like intellectual. I don't know who in Germany they they must be super bored. They figure everything else out. But someone was studying the the possibility of Everesting and they conclude that like the perfect hill which doesn't exist and like world-class Contador old school numbers the record could get down to six and a half um which again things that don't exist but uh but that was sort of well, that was sort of the number I was looking at again um, you know like that that's just a uh, 
I'm not sure if it's an Irish saying or if it's an international saying, but let's call a spade a spade. Does that yeah, make yeah, sense? Sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, like, if Egan Bernal decides tomorrow that he wants to go out and do it, don't even joke about that. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's going to do six and a half. If I can do, if I can right. do seven and four, he can do he can do six or four probably. So, right, that sort yeah. of was the 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 theory of just like okay, yeah. literally the, the the best people with the power to wait. Um, yeah, so that it, like it, besides everything yeah. else that revolves or you know how important the tour is for pro cycling, like the tour going ahead this year is vitally important for me now because <laughs> I don't want to get burned out <laughs> to go and ride at Everest. Thing. Exactly, I was losing KOMs all summer. I was like, can we start the racing back up again? <laughs> These guys can leave us alone on the internet. Um, very cool. Anything else? Uh, anything else you want to say or, or talk about? Uh, I think we got it pretty well covered there, haven't we? Yeah, okay. Was, yeah. Uh, well, I suppose I probably should thank my team. You know, and definitely should thank my team because um, my team on on both everything attempts were there for you know eight, nine, ten hours. You know, when you take in all the start time, and the celebrating time of afterwards. Your wife yeah. that you forgot my meeting, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my my wife and daughter came out for the the last hour on the first attempt, but on the second attempt, unfortunately, my wife was working, so she couldn't couldn't come out. But yeah, like uh. Andy Deary, Alan Harkins, and my parents were there. Um, Caroline Kelly and all as well were there. You know, Sean McFadden as well. I can't forget him for so long, just standing on the side of this mountain. And you know, it's it's Ireland. It's not a nice mountain to stand on. It's nice for five minutes or something like that because right. there's some incredible views. But for for eight hours, it's it's not it's not two nice of those in the rain. Yeah. yeah, and you couldn't do it without support, like so. Definitely, or couldn't couldn't do it as fast without support. I should say. No, yeah, definitely not. The the previous record holder to to be us before this became a thing to be us Lestrel, He had a he had a cooler stashed in the bushes for his for his ride, and he would you know jump on the sidewalk, go in there, and a couple of friends would hand it to him at the end. That's a uh, everything has come a long way in the last, <laughs> the last six months. Yeah, for for better or worse, I'm not sure, but yeah, it's uh, ah, it's a natural evolution of these things, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we've. Uh, Contador tried to ruin it, and you've you've ruined it quite well. <laughs> <laughs> thank uh, thank you very much. Really cool to have you on, and uh, and get to you. But I'm I want to try and get over there for a hill climb. I'll uh, I'll I'll hit you up if I do. I, th I think I'm going to start running expeditions on the more Gap uh, in in 2021 if we can internationally travel. You're the so right guy to do it. You'll be you'll be more than welcome. Awesome, awesome. All right, thanks, man. Thank you. Sort of nice guy too. Who'd uh, who'd have thunk it? Um, so yeah, thanks for watching that. Little little inspiration, little education for me, and uh, and inspiration as well. Uh, awesome to have Ronan on. Again, links to to both of his charities in the description below, as well as like his Strava ride and and whatever else. Uh, I I like this guy. I hope you do too. Um, more from uh, the Everesting twenty four seven media channel coming soon. See ya.